So today we're going to be looking at uh, the first four verses of uh, the first chapter in uh, first, Cor first Corinthians uh, chapter 15, actually, not the first chapter. But before we uh, begin, I think it's important that we establish some context in, in the actual chapter so that we understand where Paul's coming from in terms of his teaching. First, we should keep in mind that Paul is focusing here on the resurrection of the Christian, on the resurrection of the believer from the dead. For that matter, all people's resurrection. Um, those who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and those, of course, who do not believe unto uh, death. Uh, but as he teaches about the resurrection from the dead, Paul is also at the same time addressing false teaching that has come into the church regarding the resurrection. Um, in regards to that false teaching, he's addressing things such as the resurrection has already passed. If you look down at verse 12 there of chapter 15, it says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So some are under the impression that it's already passed. Um, some people believe that it was completely absurd or contrary to reason. So you have those who maybe, like we heard today, the Sadducees who just did not believe in the resurrection at all, or maybe philosophers of the day who thought, you know, this, it just doesn't make sense. It's not within human reason to believe that humans can raise bodily from the dead. Um, others thought it was just merely a state of change in man from, you know, going from a mortal body to uh, our soul, just an eternal soul. So the body dies, but my soul lives on. That could have been the idea. Um, some just altogether disowned the idea of the judgment in the age to come. They thought there was no accountability. There is no God. So as Paul says in the chapter, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Moreover, Paul teaches the church that death does not mean the end of life for Christians. Instead, it's a precursor to receiving a glorified body. In addition, Paul helps the church to make that distinction between the earthly body and a spiritual body. And then finally, Paul closes the chapter, having taught that Christ has defeated death, Paul then encourages the church to persevere in faith, knowing that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. Nevertheless, we know that false teaching has infiltrated the church. It has impacted the Corinthian church. And Paul's concerned that God's people were in danger of having their faith shaken. So today, as we study these first four verses of the 15th chapter, we'll see that Paul does the most important thing that any minister could do for God's people that are in this state, the state of being frazzled, their state of having their faith shaken. He reminds them to come back to the doctrines of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the doctrines of Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection, and of course, all for the sake of sinners like ourselves. So just to kind of give you guys a real brief outline, we're, just, we're gonna have two points in today's um, Sunday school lesson. Number one, we're gonna look at the significance of the gospel in verses one through three. And then in verses three through four, we're gonna look at the substance of the gospel. But before we get started, let's take a moment to pray and seek God's blessing. Our Heavenly Father, today as we um, take a close look at the gospel message, as we consider the resurrection and how important it is to the gospel message, we pray that you would cause us, Lord, to look upon Jesus by faith, that you would cause us, Lord, to believe the gospel even more. We've already um, accepted the gospel, Lord. We've heard the gospel. We've trusted in Christ, but how we need the gospel every day, Lord. And so we pray that you would remind us of it that our faith would be strengthened, and that we would have a hope, Lord, for the future, and even now in this age, Lord. We thank you for this time, and we pray that you would bless your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Okay, so we're going to start uh, by reading uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. So it says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And there ends the reading of God's word. So as we begin uh, our study of the gospel message this morning, again, with that context of emphasizing the resurrection for God's church, uh, in verse 1, we see here that Paul begins by reminding the church 
that there's one and only one gospel that he's ever preached. Um, he reminds the church that this is the gospel that he's delivered to them, that they themselves heard with their ears. So he, in a sense, appeals to them and reminds them that when I came with this message, I haven't changed it. And when I come time and time again, it's the message that you're always going to hear. And it's fitting that Paul would do this, not because God's people were forgetful per se. I mean, we can be forgetful. Um, but because God's people were at times led astray by distortions of the gospel. Now, Barry, if you could read for us Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, kind of speaks to this. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the gospel of Christ or a different gospel, which is really not another gospel, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Okay, so we see that, again, people may come with a whole different gospel. Uh, it could be a message, a false message, maybe intertwining some elements of the gospel, but, or maybe twisting the gospel, but not giving us what we're going to hear today as Paul will outline it in just a bit. It was this gospel of Jesus Christ that the church of God had received, according to verse 1, and that had been, they had been convinced of, or at least they had professed to believe. Okay? Um, Paul notes that it was a gospel on which the church had also taken their stand. Yet it was a message that they needed to continue in. So it's not good enough just to you know, hear it and then forget about it, but it's something that we need to continue to attend to. So it's vital that the church not only receives the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the, that we also stand firm in this gospel. God's word to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Pastor Ron reminded us this morning, is the very foundation of our faith. Without it, we cannot be rooted and grounded in our saving faith. Instead, we would find ourselves, if we're honest, neck deep in sin and in the misery of our sin and having no hope in this age or hope even for the age to come. Um, we can see uh, evidence of this. Paul speaks of this in verses 33 to 34. Um, he warns the church. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. This is in the 15th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians. He says, come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. So if we abandon that gospel message, that, that gospel message that we heard with such great joy um, and excitement, I, I bet you guys can all look back to the time that you believed for the first time in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was in tears when I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was such an amazing time. Uh, it's it's a, a time of excitement when we first come to the Lord. But it's a message that shouldn't be exciting just that one time. It's a message that should excite us each and every single time that we hear it. It should invigorate us. It should kind of feel us like we're born again every single time that we hear it. You know, we, we hear s such great promises and such great comforts, you know, delivered to us as we hear the gospel message. Now, moving on to verse 2, Paul also tells the church that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation if we believe. He says there in verse 2, By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. So how is this gospel the power of God unto salvation for those who believe? How so? Well, according to verse 2, God's people must hold firmly to it. In verse 1, we heard that we needed to stand firm in the gospel message. But it's something that we also need to hold firmly to. As God's people, we're privileged to commit the gospel to memory. We're privileged to meditate on the gospel as good news to you and me. It's, you know, in a world that's filled with bad news, sometimes the gospel is the only good news that we get, and we should really relish in it, right? Um, and as we're invited to God to attend to the preaching of the gospel as his means of grace to us, that's another privilege that we should attend to. We should make an effort to you know, try to never miss church, but be amongst God's people and hear the word preached to us as we're edified as a body. Now, to not do so would mean that we're hearing and receiving God's gospel message to some degree in vain. Nevertheless, I don't want us to get confused. True faith is never in vain. For any measure of faith that we receive, any measure of faith that we have, our ability to believe in the gospel message we know is a gift of God, not anything that we do so that we do not boast, as Paul says. For we know that Christ is the author and the perfecter or finisher of our faith. So perhaps Paul was warning the church not to 
hear or to receive the gospel as some mere historical account uh, with temporary significance or to treat the gospel as common and not holy. You know, in, in this world, we see things that are common. Uh, we treat them as common. We get in our car, we turn it on, it's a common object. But then there's other things that we treat as holy, as very special, as set apart by God uh, for his own glory, for his own purposes, his very word, um, ministers that he sets apart for himself. Um, God has done all of these things for his glory. And we should not treat the gospel message as common, but we should treat it as very special, something that God has set aside for us as a means of grace for us. Um, moreover, Paul points out that it was also vanity, because he's speaking here about believing in vain. We've, we've heard the word vanity before in the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, Solomon speaks about certain things in this life can seem vain apart from the Lord. Um, and in the same way, we can take God's name in vain when we don't use it uh, to direct ourselves to him. You know, perhaps sometimes it could be used as a cuss word. We hear people around us do it all the time. We hear it in movies. Um, but here, uh, Paul points out that it's vanity for the church to profess Christ, but not hold to the resurrection. To deny the resurrection doesn't make sense. It's to take Christ's name in vain. Uh, let's look at verses 17 and 19. In verses 17 and 19, maybe, uh, Larry, if you're there, would you read verses 17 through 19, please? And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men the most pitiable. So Paul, in essence, is saying, what good does it do us to trust in Christ if it's only for this lifetime? To not believe that there's a resurrection, to not believe that we have life beyond the grave in Christ is total nonsense. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And he says we're to be pitied if that's our state of mind. Um, so Paul would have us remember the resurrection and not to exclude it. It's key. It's central to the gospel message, as we'll see. Now, moving on to verse 3. Not only was the gospel a message that the church had received, but it was one that Paul had also himself received. Look at verse 3. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now, Paul had received it, but yet, unlike the church, Paul had not received the gospel from men, but he had received it from God himself. This is why Paul presents the gospel with such great emphasis to the church. In other words, the gospel is a principal doctrine. It should take first place. It's a first importance in our lives. And he says that to the church. And you may be thinking, but why? What about other things? Like, what about the Lord's Supper? What about baptism? Those are all doctrines, right, that we receive in the church. Aren't those important? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. They're means of grace to us. But Paul says here, this, the gospel message, is a doctrine of first importance. Well, we're now going to turn our attention to what makes the gospel message so important. And that's, we're going to look at there in verse, verses 3 and 4. And what makes the gospel message so important is the substance of the gospel message. Paul tells us here in the latter part of verse 3, he says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins, not his own. It's very important to remember that. We know that Christ was sinless, blameless, the perfect son of God. He came and lived a righteous life, perfectly obedient to the Father, did what Adam could not do, did what Israel could not do. He gave us a, a wonderful picture of what it meant to obey God perfectly. This, of course, means that because he lived that life of perfect obedience, of, of life to, you know, to God for us too, that is why his life and his death, by his life and his death, he's able to obtain for you and for me pardon for our sins, but he's also make, able to make atonement for our sins in order that you and I who trust in him might be able to be reconciled to God. Now, I want to talk about that a little bit here because in terms of the application, at times you and I might have a little trouble believing that Christ died for our sins. Surely, he died for other people's sins, but I'm just not that deserving. 
that could enter our minds at times. You know, the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith says that uh, when we sin, sometimes that very sin could have that effect of making us doubt uh, or even us just feeling God's displeasure in that moment. However, as we examine ourselves in the Lord, let us not doubt that Christ has died for you and for me. Even as we wrestle with our sin, remember to look to him for forgiveness in repentance. He himself said that he did not come for the righteous, but to save sinners. Therefore, when you're looking for peace in the midst of the misery of your sin, by faith, look to your Savior who died on the cross for your sins. You know, when we look, when we try to look introspectively, all we're ever going to see is disappointing things. You know, there's some good things that we do, most certainly. The, the image of God is not completely erased from us, you know, because of our sin. But at the same time, we know that our perfect happiness comes in Christ. And as we do the things that we do in Christ for the glory of God. So when you sin and when you're doubting that you're saved, when you're doubting that God doesn't love you, remember that Christ has died for your sins. He's hung on the cross in the past for you. And he did that, that you might be forgiven, that you might be reconciled to God. Find great comfort in that. Don't look to yourself but look to the Son of Man who was lifted up for you, that he might draw many to himself. Paul not only reminds us, uh, the church, that Christ died for their sins, but that this work of redemption, it's rooted in the earliest of divine revelation, that is the Old Testament. It was the will of God that Christ should suffer. Now, as strange as that may sound, you know, we're going to look at some Old Testament scriptures right now that remind us that this is true. So all that was foretold in the Old Testament about the Messiah had now been fulfilled uh, through Jesus Christ's sufferings and through his death. Now, I just want to remind you guys real quickly of Genesis 3. We hear of the great promise that God made in Genesis 3, verse 15, when he said that he would bruise his head, speaking of Jesus uh, crushing the serpent's head, but at the same time that his heel would be bruised, right? He would crush the head of the serpent but his heel would be bruised. So that's significant of the sufferings of Christ. We, we remember Psalm 22, where we hear of um, David writing, of course, Psalm 22, but it's speaking of Jesus prophetically, how he would be pierced. Um, and of course here, speaking of a crucifixion, 700 years even before a crucifixion existed. All right? it's, it's awesome to know that God ordained these things to happen and that they came to pass, they were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Robert, would you be so kind to read Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed by our iniquities. Upon, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes... Wonderful words of promise, seeing that Christ's sufferings result in our peace with God. Um, Janet, would you kindly read for us verses 10 and 11? Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Amen. So again, wonderful words of, of promise. Again, uh, words that foreshadow what Christ would do for us on the cross. Um, now, having heard that Christ died for our sins here in verse 3, it almost kind of sounds like we could wrap it up here. You know, we've, we've heard the gospel. That's great news. Christ has died for me. But Christ dying for our sins is really good news. Okay, we have to remember that. It's, it's so often the, the theme of the many songs that we sing or the word that we hear in church. Um, it's sometimes we would think maybe even the very center of the gospel message. However, there's so much more. And Paul, again, is addressing this very topic in this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul continues to detail the gospel for the church by noting that Christ was also buried. Now, the mention of this burial would serve 
uh, a reminder for the church to show that Jesus Christ really did die. Jesus was not unconscious or asleep or in some type of coma. Being placed in the tomb was the very proof that Jesus had died. You know, we know that uh, church history would tell us that some people believe that Jesus really didn't die in the flesh. Uh, and, and that teaching was infiltrating the church. So we must be reminded of the fact that because he was buried, that was the very proof, uh, you know, being buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, that Jesus really did suffer and die a real death. But the good news is that he didn't remain in that tomb. Instead, the scripture tells us here in verse 4, it says that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that's really, really good news, to know that Jesus didn't stay dead, that our Savior, uh, many, many times people look upon Christ and his death and they say, how can he be a Savior? How can one who has been nailed to a cross, who appears to be totally weak, um, be a Savior? Well, the answer to that is because he rose again from the dead. He rose again that third day. Larry? I mean, I've, I've heard it said that, you know, there's a crucifix, a cross with Jesus hanging on it, and yet there's a cross empty. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the cross is empty signifies his death, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. Absolutely. Whereas sometimes people get hung up when they see him still hanging on the cross, meaning, is that all there is? Yeah. And like you say, no. <laughs> There's so much more. And that, that's Paul's whole point. Barry. Well, two points, real quick. Bounce off Larry. In other words, the world will want him either helplessly in a manger hmm. or helplessly nailed to a cross. Uh, it's, I think Larry's point. The other thing is, you know, Romans 4.25, he was delivered over for our offenses and raised for our justification. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. You'll hear that again in just a moment. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. It's good to hear it twice. <laughs> um, so we see here that just like Jesus' death and his, uh, his burial and his resurrection also have their roots in the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, Psalm 16.10. Let me turn there real quick. Psalm 16.10 speaks to his burial. It says here in Psalm 16.10, Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Some translations say, or see corruption. So we see here that Jesus really was buried, but again, he didn't stay there. That verse also not only speaks of his burial, but also speaks of his resurrection. Now, in order to show the church that these doctrines of Christ's burial and resurrection on the third day were not new. Paul then reiterates, if you see there again in verse four, he says, according to the scriptures in verse three, but he says it a second time in verse four, he says that Jesus was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Um, he, re he reiterates this again to show that it was in accordance with God's revelation in the Old Testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ pointed to the prophet Jonah uh, of course, in uh, the first chapter, the 17th verse, foreshadowing his very own resurrection. Uh, in Matthew 12, 40, you know, Jesus said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, at first, Christ's resurrection from the dead may sound like good news for Jesus alone, right? He's He's been vindicated before his enemies. You know, we saw his, almost his entire life he was attacked. Uh, people did not believe in him. Many people did, but there were many people who did not. Uh, so he was vindicated before his enemies by his father. He's being declared the son of God with power as he's being resurrected. But Paul also reminds us in Romans, as Barry just reminded us as well, that he was raised from the dead for our justification. And because he lives... We live in Him, and His righteousness is imputed to us by faith. And that's just absolute, like, wonderful good news. Again, if you take the resurrection out, there is no imputation of righteousness to you and to me. And it's good news to know that despite the fact that I'm faulty and that I sin and wrestle with sin still in this lifetime, that you and I still have the righteousness imputed to us 
that belongs to Jesus Christ, that he earned, that he merited by living a perfect life and by being perfectly obedient to the Father, that he shares that with us, that he gives that to us as we trust in him, as we believe in him, as we follow him. Now, in closing, today we saw the significance of the gospel for the life of the church. Now, there's many distortions of the gospel that seem to abound, but the church must remember the following. Number one, first we must hold fast to the gospel message. It has to be of first importance to you and to me and attended to as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Otherwise, you and I have no real hope. We also must not omit any detail of the gospel. To deny the resurrection is to separate Christ altogether from the, from the gospel. For he himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live though he die. Pastor Ron shared that this morning. Again, there's a lot of things that, you know, God wanted us to hear twice today, which is good. We must also keep in mind that Jesus' death and resurrection are absolutely inseparable. God uses both to work out our full redemption. We see that in his death, we have our sins forgiven, but we also see that in his rising again, we are promised again, Jesus being the first fruits, uh, we are promised that we will be raised just as he was raised. We will be raised by that very same power that uh, Jesus was raised by, uh, by his spirit, we will also be raised. So that they work together, they cannot be separated. Uh, to get rid of one would undo the gospel message and it wouldn't serve us any purpose. As Paul says, we would be pitied. Uh, we would be fools. Now, as we close, may we, you and I seek to delight ourselves in the treasures that the gospel brings to you and to me. As we embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, may we remember that his death has taken away our sins and by his resurrection, the righteousness of Christ himself becomes bestowed on you and me. And I'd like to close with some prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the gospel of your Son. Your word says it is your very power for the salvation of sinners. Yet you do more than save through this message. Through it, we're encouraged, we're grounded, and given a hope of life beyond the grave. By your grace, may you give us strength to continue to hold fast to this message for your name's sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.